All right. Hey, everybody. Joe Bergamini here. Sorry about the brief delay. Uh, this, is, this is a busy man I have on as my guest here today. This is a little bananas, gentlemen. Sorry. Yes. Welcome to a, uh, an SEM webinar. So I started a new session for this. So please come on in, join us, shoot in your comments. We are live. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook um, for an SEM webinar. And today I'm very, very excited to have Mr. Will Calhoun, the great Mr. Will Calhoun is my guest. Welcome, Will. Thank you for your patience, everyone. We apologize for that. And thank you, Joe, for having me on. Uh, my, it's really my pleasure. I've been so looking forward to this. And thanks, everybody, for the delay. But don't worry. We are going to pump Will for information. We're going to have a great time. This is going to be awesome. So um, for, for those of you who, um, you know, I'm sure our viewers know all about Will playing with Living Color, multi-platinum, Grammy-winning band. Um, he's an ideal guest for me to have as an SEN guest because I view Will as not only one of the world's great players, but as an eternal student. Um, he has, he's a prolific uh, artist in his own right with his albums, uh, two of which I want to discuss today, Life in This World and um, his tribute to Elvin Jones, Celebrating Elvin Jones. Um, so we'll get to two of those two things. Will also does a lot of film scoring. He's traveled the world, lived in Africa for a while, and he's actually a friend of SEN. Will participated in a Chicago event that we had where he was on a panel, and that was where we first got to really work together, and then um, I got to see some of your classes there, so that was really great. So, so Will, with all that, you've been with SEN before. Welcome back. It's great to have you, and thank you. let's dive right in. Um, one of my traditional places, I, and guys, please feel free um, to type in your questions. One of the places I love to start with all my guests and um, and you in particular is with your mentors and the people who were important to you in your formative years. I know, so you, you, you're you from the Bronx, you still live in the Bronx in New York? I live in the Bronx, yes. Um, so who, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> so, who, so when you were learning and when you were coming up, who, who were the key people for you? Like, was there a drum teacher or was it, you know, just learning from your family or what, who were the main mentors and teachers early on? There were a few people. My older brother was a prodigy and played drums really well at a young age. That's why I started late. I started when I was 16. Huh. Uh, our house was the house. It was kind of the SIR in the neighborhood. It was a house where we lived in a two family house and my mom decided to designate the uh, floor, the first floor apartment to the local musicians in the community. So everyone left their gear bass, guitars. She had a PA system down there. Um, I grew up in a really fortunate part of the Bronx because I had Steve Jordan lived around the corner from me, um, who was who was my brother's age. So I got to see Steve come over when I was four, five, six years old. The great Ray Chu, for those who don't know, he's a great musical director for the voice shows and the Apollo show. And Ray was a prodigy as well. He finished high school to went on, went on to uh, become the musical director for Ashford and Simpson and so many other great artists. And there's a great drummer that's not known, unfortunately, to the public that should be known, named Errol Bedwood. His nickname was Pumpkin. Pumpkin lived about 10 blocks away, and he single-handedly is responsible for why we have hip-hop the way we have it. He was selling beats to labels in 1972. Wow. Incredible drummer, incredible classical pianist, incredible bass player. And uh, these guys and other guys like these were right in my neighborhood. So in terms of mentors, I had fantastic ones, starting with those three gentlemen. And then I had um, Lou Donaldson from my neighborhood, the great jazz saxophonist. Um, my mother's a very religious woman and, and, and goes to church every Sunday. And Lou Donaldson attends the same church, the Presbyterian church around the corner from here. So I got a chance to meet some jazz royalty also at a young age and talk about jazz and ask him questions about miles and train and so on. So, uh, yeah, it starts with the neighborhood and the community and, and my home. And it was great that I can just go in my basement and see jazz trios, organ, gospel choir rehearsals, uh, funk band. I lost you for a second there, Will. Uh, okay, yeah. Well, All did... these things were... were... We so, got you. so, you know, that's... That, that's that's the basis of it, and then from then from from coming from this neighborhood, I went on to to study and and get private lessons. But just before I wanted to become a drummer or a musician, really it was the neighborhood that that was um. And I can't leave out a very 
a nice man who's not with us anymore, Mr. Palumba. There was a music store called Palumba Music on Gun Hill Road uh, mm -hmm. in the Bronx. It's still there. Mike Palumba, his son, Mikey Palumba, kind of handles it now. But Mr. Palumba was like fresh from Italy, came over in the 50s and opened up a music academy in our neighborhood. So we also, my brother, not me, but my brother's community also had an opportunity to um, to uh, study at, a, at a, an academy uh, in the neighborhood. So uh, if you look it up now, Palumba Music, it's still on Gun Hill Road in the Bronx. And that was also a place for us to to, to go to take lessons. Yeah. So yeah, it's amazing you had such a rich community there with everything. I Somewhere along the way, I didn't know you didn't start till 16. So you were like, you were probably in a band the day you started you picked up the sticks, I'm guessing, right? I noodled, man. I was a motocross freak. That's what I did up here in the North Bronx. Um, <laughs> I was into motocross racing, and I had a couple of friends out in Long Island and a few friends from Jersey, and their parents would take our bikes out, and we would, I raced out there in a white plain, in a, a white stone bridge area of, of, of um, Queens in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did first. That was my first passion. And uh, my mom came to my first race and basically said, I hope you really enjoyed that because that's the last race you're going to have. So um, I took my bike and back and cashed it in for, uh, cashed it in basically. And then I went to buy my first drum kit. So that was around age 15, 16. And I started taking lessons yeah. around that time. And when you took the lessons, was it at a local, was it at Palumbo's or a local store or? Uh, I took lessons at Drummers Collective. It was the beginning of Drummers Collective. I cracked open a modern drummer magazine and I looked in the back of the magazine and I saw the school and I went down to Jones Collective. My first teacher then and still dear friend now was Horace Arnold. Yes. And I studied with Horace and that was the beginning of me really um, being around other great teachers at the school like Frankie Malibu and a few other guys yeah. and, and, and having an opportunity to um, be in New York and take lessons in New York. So Horace was and still is fantastic. He introduced me to Max Roach, right. Bob Blakey, yeah. Alvin Jones, Charlie Purser, uh, uh, so Ken McIntyre, so many great drummers that um, uh, it, it opened up my my ears as a 16 year old to be able to talk to those guys about music and brush playing and and I went to the to the gigs, the Vanguard and the Village Gate and these places to watch these masters play. So Horace and Horace introduced me to to uh, to, to the Zildjian family as well. Wow. So we, we talked a little last night. There's so many ways we can go with what to talk about today. And there's so much to talk about. Um, but I'm just curious about the scene then. Like, so you mentioned when Horace introduced you to all those uh, jazz greats, but did you, did you see a lot of those people play before you were a drummer? Like, did your mom take you to, to jazz gigs to see them? And then- No, no, oh, okay. I heard the music. I, my father was an avid jazz fan. I had great jazz recordings in the house and I was able to, uh, listen to great recordings of right. Thelonious Monk and John Coltrane and Duke Ellington and um, all these other great masters. But no, I did not see them until uh, I had a chance to, to be introduced to them by Horace and not only see them, to talk to them because jazz musicians to me were like the coolest people in the world. And they were, magi they were like magicians in a way. You saw these really cool gentlemen come into a club and make so much music on a four piece kit with two cymbals. You know, right. the brushes, the mallets, swing time, solos, setting guys up. It, it was just, for me, it was an amazing experience to see Art Blakey sitting next to his hi-hat or see Elvin Jones sitting in the front row and also other other drummers. You know, at, at 16, I started to go out. So I saw Billy Cobham and Narada Michael Walden and Terry Bazio. I saw other drummers that were playing uh, in town that I, I was interested in. I wasn't just interested in jazz drummers, but that was my introduction. Right. And then you, so you got your degree from Berkeley and I believe it was a production or something. Production and engineering is the title. Okay. <laughs> and um, so when I, you know, obviously I keep, became aware of you living color coming up in the same scene and playing New York, you guys were already huge. Were you, so with, did living color happen? Like you came back from Berkeley and then that hit, or were you already playing with the guys at, at Berkeley and it's stuff? Good like question, that? man. It happened. I met Vernon through Jocko Pistorius, believe it or not. Um, I was a huge I fan <laughs> of a band that scared New York called Bushrock. And at that time, I was studying with Kenwood Denard, who I think is one of the best drum teachers in the universe. Legend. In terms of academic breaking down things. And uh, this guy is really a super genius. But I was studying with Kenwood on and off when I could. 
and uh, I he was playing with Bushrock, a band that I also love. I was in Boston in college. I drove down to see the show, and the show was mind blowing. And every, a lot of drummers were there. Omar, Hakeem. I saw a bunch of guys. I saw George Benson in the audience. Everyone went to see Bushrock. That was the band in New York that you went to see. And um, Jocko was there. I did one gig with Jocko where he played piano and I played uh, drums and he hired a bass player at a venue called the Jazz Cultural Theater, which is like a workshop kind of a jazz club. Mm -hmm. And Jocko was writing songs for his word of mouth record. So he would give us these melodies and lead sheets and he would stop us. <laughs> he would take, he had like five pencils in his hair. He would take the pencil out of his hair and start to write ideas down and then start us over again. It was an amazing gig. Wow. And um, we laughed about it later, but I went to, to, to this club uh, and to see Bush Rock and Jocko was there and he said, hello. He said, oh, by the way, you need to meet this guy. And Vernon walked by and, and I met Vernon and I assumed Vernon was a bass player all those years for many years. And I went back to, I was a junior in college. I went back to Berkeley. And when I graduated from Berkeley, Vernon and I stayed in touch. He had a radio show. I had a band in college called Dark Sarcasm and Columbia Records was interested in signing my band. It didn't happen, but it was a long romantic demo making process. But Vernon played my band's music on his radio show. And then the great JT Lewis at that time was playing drums with Living Color. And JT left the band to go off and do other tours. And Vernon asked me to, to join the band. So that's kind of, just so you know, it was, Wow, that's kind of how that happened. But it, but Jocko was responsible for that. That's that's crazy. I did not know that. That's crazy. So who? So when you came back and Living Color was there's two things I want to ask. One was, um, who were who were the key guys for you for your that inspired you with your rock playing? Wow, key guys. Um, Buddy Miles, Mitch Mitchell, John Bonham. Um, inspired me uh, charlie watts mm -hmm. um i mean young younger days those were kind of the guys that off the off the bat right uh, i think that were immediate oh wow let me check out what they're doing because not only did i like the drumming i liked the way they were playing the music right that right. was the beginning i dug into deeper guys after that but those were the first ones that i Hang on a minute. What's going on here? We got gotcha. you. And I started to get into into it. That way. Wow, that's great. Well, I, I as far as your you know your rock playing, if your if your sole contribution was the drum part in Cult of Personality, you'd be in the pantheon for me. As for, it's like just a perfect drum part. First time I heard like yeah, I, mean, I heard it when I was pretty formative, you know. So I was like hearing what you're doing with the hat and you know, of course, not knowing you had all these other influences I, that I didn't know about yet. Um, talk, right. Can you talk a little bit about? We talked a little bit about the failure aspect, like so. The, the scene for rock in New York when Living Color was before you guys got signed was pretty healthy for rock bands. There were a lot of you guys played CBGBs, the Legendary Club, many times. Um, what was the scene like for rock bands? And can you talk about how um, we talked a little before about how it wasn't clear that there'd be success? Sometimes, like if labels are coming or you're, you know, there, there's like never knowing whether success is going to happen, right? So it was sort correct, of correct. Well, I mean, the, 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 the environment was fertile, very. The Cat Club, uh, Peppermint Lounge. When I first played there when I was 16 in high school, I played with a band that opened for Deborah Harry. Uh, I didn't know who she was. I didn't know what the music was at the time, but then later on, it was Deborah Harry. So the Mud Club, there were so many cool places in the Lower East Side. The music scene was really jumping off. It was a great time in New York. At that time, we had Basquiat was doing amazing things with his painting. Graffiti was taking off. Um, hip hop was kind of just, so it was a Renaissance thing. So the rock was just, it was in there with everything else. It, 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 it was a really great time for punk, alternative music, mm -hmm. electronic music, alternative, it, all of these cool things. You know, Pura Ubu was playing. There were all these cool bands and cool uh, ideas happening inside the realm of rock and roll. It wasn't just ROCK, you know? It was like cross-pollination. So, yeah, yeah. It started, it was because everybody started hanging out with everybody. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, uh, Deborah Harry was hanging out with, with up, up on 145th Street in Harlem with some of the rap cats at some of the those clubs uptown, the Disco mm -hmm. Fever and things, places like that. 
And those cats were coming out of CBGBs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you totally. had brothers walking in there with Lee jeans on and, <laughs> and, and gold chains and Adidas sneakers, and they're coming into a club with guys with spiked hair. Right. But that's that. That was kind of the beginning. And I think the, in my opinion, the biggest artist rap band that benefited from that marriage was Run DMC, mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. a doubt, without a doubt. I right. think they they really took the best of that time and put it into hit songs that made them superstars. But yeah, the, the scene was fertile. I mean, it was it was a great time. And a lot of record labels were out. You had a lot of people hunting for bands. They were desperate for new talent. Mm -hmm. You had younger, in my opinion, very clever A&R people that used to hang out in clubs. The A&R job wasn't a suit and tie person that went out to go find the music. They were already in record stores. Mm -hmm. They were already in the flea markets. They were already in the clubs. So the A&R people, we saw them hanging out. You know, you could see someone at a at a at a, a coffee shop or, or at a vinyl used vinyl store or oh, that guy works for capital or oh, that guy works for sony that guy works for so the, the, the relationships were very tangible at that time however this is a business <laughs> and, and um you know we did as i mentioned to you last night spent many many years let, let me not exaggerate two years three years maybe max playing around the same venues in new york and having the same record company people come to the show and tell us that we sounded amazing and you guys are unique and you're one of a kind and no one signed us. Mm -hmm. So uh, my advice to young folks out there watching, you don't have to be that young, but I mean, you have to stick to what you love. Live in Color, we never changed our, our concept. We played our own music, although we love covers. We covered The Police, we covered Miles, we covered Santana, we covered The Stones, we covered yeah. Bowie. Right. You know, we, 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 just, we love music, so we had fun. We covered James Brown, we covered Anthrax, we covered the, uh, the Ramones, we covered Bad Brains. So, we, you know, we were just having fun with the music, but in our independent way. So that was the beginning of, of us uh, uh, um, really having a go at what we felt was our art form. But you have to just know, like anybody, if you read anyone's biography, or Bruce Lee or Jimi Hendrix, or, it, it's, it's always any painters, they've all suffered through that period of rejection. Very few artists or writers come on the scene and people love them right away. Mm -hmm. Totally. Unfortun totally. Unfortunately, for some great artists, it happens after they die, they get discovered. Yeah. So uh, I was ready for the rejection. I wasn't phased by it. I knew what we were doing was, was, was great and unique. And I, I felt like, honestly, Joe, it was going to take about 10 Living Color records before uh, Living Color would be able to be quote, quote unquote known. Mm -hmm. But it happened on the first record, which I'm sure, speaking for the band, we were all incredibly shocked by the success of that album. Mm -hmm. But we went into it 100% with the same hardcore, we're going to win victory attitude and fun. We were having fun, too. Mm -hmm. and, and, and not afraid of a Rolling Stone or someone telling us the record sucked. We didn't care about that. We knew. I never played the record when I walked out of the studio. I said, I'm done. It sounds great. The mixes right. were great. There was no reason for me to listen to it anymore. Mm -hmm. Mission accomplished. Most of my uh, vivid vinyls are still in the plastic. Um, <laughs> but um, I felt like, you know, we did that. Now, next, let's get on and start playing this stuff live. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you, you, you have to understand that massive amounts of failure, massive amounts of failure come with success. Mm. Wow. So... I want to, I, I want, I, there's so much I could ask you about Living Color, but I do want to talk about your travels and I want to talk about Elvin. Um, let's start with Elvin. There's some great, by the so many great comments. You should come back later and see all the love, all these people typing in these beautiful uh, greetings and compliments to you, Will. Um, wow, thank you. So let's talk about uh, celebrating Elvin Jones. So yeah. this is a fairly recent. So what was the seed of the idea to come back now and, and pay tribute to Elvin? My favorite drummer in the world, uh, followed Elvin around. I think when I first bought my place, um, the first piece of furniture or art that I have is like a massive fireplace size picture of Elvin. It was a gift, by the way. But that was the proudest thing I hung up. I didn't have a phone yet or a couch. <laughs> <laughs> That's priorities. I had, a drum kit, I had a drum kit and an Elvin picture and running water. That was, that was great. You know, it was, that was enough for me. But, uh, um, why? Because I thought about it, Joe, honestly, for a very long time. I didn't know how to do it because I love everything Elvin has done. 
and I didn't want to do like a Coltrane thing. I didn't want to do uh, a copy of his music. Um, I think if any drummers know Elvin's work really well, they, they can hear him, his influence on me on every Living Color record, or if you ever see me play live, it's I think it's very evident. But uh, um, I, I couldn't figure out Joe how I wanted to do it. So I was starting to interview uh, uh, alumni guys. One of my dear friends, Antoine Roney, has tons of stage recordings of the band. So I, he lent those to me, and I started going, hmm, let me think about this. And then I, I talked to Elvin's, I took, I called, at the time, his wife, uh, uh, he was still around when I started the idea, but after he passed, I called his widow, I called Keiko Jones. Keiko, yeah. And I just wanted to ask her permission. Um, I want to do this recording. I don't want to get a nasty email later on. <laughs> I want to celebrate your husband's work and I don't know how I'm going to do it yet, but I will get back to you in a respectful way. And I hope you approve of it. She gave me her blessing. Excellent. And then I, my, my last interview was probably with, um, Sonny fortune, who was a dear friend of Alvin and, uh, Sonny had his opinion about what I was doing. He didn't agree with everything. He's not with us anymore. God bless him. The late great Sonny fortune. But you know, Sonny was, uh, uh a little angled because him and Alvin were great friends. But I decided after a long period, uh, Joe, of interviews, talking to people, listening to tapes of live shows, listening to my own records, I was going to assemble a Elvin Jones project concept because the record labels I was talking to at the time were thinking, what are you going to do? And who wants to hear that? The record that I love, one of my favorite albums of all time is Elvin Jones on the Mountain. I love that record with Gene Perler on bass and Jan Hammer on keyboards and piano because Elvin to me is playing completely acoustic, I think, indigenous electronic drumming on this record. And it's a fantastic recording. If you ever want to hear Elvin play in an electronic setting and still hear Elvin be Elvin Jones, that's the most profound recording that I think that he has of him playing. He is nailing every song mm. and my original idea was to cover the album because mm. I love the record mm. so much. But then I thought, wait a minute, he's got great solo records and his brothers are great musicians, you know, yeah. and, and how am I going to do this? So I, what you see on the recording is a hybrid of me kind of uh, honing my ideas down into a Coltrane piece, obviously some of his pieces. I didn't want to do the obvious thing, which was Three Card Molly, because everyone knows that right. song. And it is on another record that I've done previously. But I do like EJ Blues. So I wanted to open the record with EJ Blues. Mm -hmm. So basically, Joe, I did a academic and personal research on Elvin, and I wanted to nail it and get the right vibe. And then when I got down to doing the one song that I love on, on uh, uh, the Elvin Jones on the Mountain record, it's called Destiny. Mm -hmm. And Jan Hammer is on that, rec is on that mm -hmm. he's on the album. And um, I don't know, I just decided to reach out to Jan. <laughs> now... I'm a huge Jan Hammer fan, massive yeah. Jan Hammer fan. I have everything, even though people thought he sold out with the with Miami Vice. Miami stuff, Vice, I, yeah. I have all of the commercial Miami Vice. I have all of his TV music. Yeah. I, I'm a Jan fan. Yeah. So I was up uh, in, in uh, upstate New York uh, mixing another recording, and the engineer was mates with uh, Jan, he was friends with Jan. And um, he said, What are you working on? Well, I played him the album stuff. He said, Man, you ever think about contacting Jan? Because I recorded the song at first without him and I wasn't going to use it. And he said, you should call him. And I decided to call him. And he got back to me and he was really kind and he played on the track and completely nailed it and edited the track and mixed the track for me. Wow. Which was wow. a triple gift. So um, that was the, the last piece. But why Elvin? I'm a fan study them inside out and I still do and I felt like it was time for me in my career and in my life to do this recording and, and respectfully celebrate Elvin Jones and not try to copy him or you know have the same format that he has but just to celebrate him in the most respectful way as possible while still being able to you know do the Will Calhoun yeah. do Will Calhoun yeah. <laughs> so, and for everybody listening the record is celebrating Elvin Jones and in listening to it Will you 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 capture his ethos. I mean, the, the, the things you're playing. Um, I just wondered if you, did you go through 
in when you did your research for the album or earlier, did it did it get to the level like did you transcribe? Like did you get micro with the stuff or yes. Did, yes. Oh yeah. okay. I transcribed, I got micro, I watched footage, I have my own bootlegs. Um, I wanted to make wow. certain things that I was writing down where actually he was playing them that way. You know, Elvin's triplet is almost difficult to academically break down. It's it's almost a unsolvable mathematic equation in three because it, it, it doesn't line up, you know, anywhere within the quarter notes or the dotted quarter notes. It's somewhere in between. It's like a Brazilian maraca too. It's, it's you know, you hear rattle McHugh's and you hear roughs, but they're not in the same place all the time. Right. So um, I watched them, and I was I, I had one great clinic. I did a clinic with Elvin, me, me, Elvin Jones, and and um, and, and uh, Giovanni Hidalgo. <sighs> so I got to hang out with him in a clinic, which was mind blowing because yeah. watching them sound. And a, he did a clinic with just him and Gene Perla. So it was bass and drums. It was fantastic. Oh my God. Educational uh, uh, piece for any drummer to watch time be stretched, elastic. His brush playing his mallet playing, uh, his sense of humor. He's a very elegant speaker. All of those things were, were a part of his playing. Yeah. And I always figured him like he was like the um, the ballet dancer in one hand and the heavyweight champion in the other. You know, he could play really, really soft on a brush to the point where you almost couldn't hear the note. And he also could hit that ride cymbal like he was trying to take Mike Tyson out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he had both of those dynamic ranges in his and everything in between. So uh, mm -hmm. I didn't look at them as a jazz drummer to me. Uh, he always sounded electric. Mm -hmm. He always sounded like an electric drummer to me. Yeah. Well, I mean, the drummers of every style all cite him as such a huge influence. But yeah, I was just, oh, we lost Will again now. Let's see what's happened. See if he comes back. Wow. Well, that was great. We'll give it a couple seconds here. Um, I have links um, that Will shared with me, and um, I will put them in the comments. Um, if I can get, if I get Will back, we will continue on. Um, if not, then today might, that might be the end of our interview, but um, let me see if I can, um, I'll share here uh, Will's site. Oh, hang on, Will's coming back in. I, no, I think he's coming back in, maybe not. Um, let me see, let me show you guys Will's site. It is right here. And um, you can go on and look at the, the Elvin Jones albums. What I wanted to ask Will about and will I, what I will if he comes back is um, life in this world because he lived in Africa for quite some time and studied there and uh, learned a lot of great things. So, um, but I would definitely recommend checking out this uh, Elvin album. And then after the session is over. I, I, I hear you, are you there? Oh, you're still here. Good, 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 good. Oh, you're coming in and out, Will. I guess you can still hear me, but I can't hear you. Oh, you're still there. Okay. Can you see me? Yeah, you got your back. Would your phone ring or something? I'm back. <laughs> no, no, it just it, the screen just did a change. Oh, okay. Know, I don't know what happened there. Well, well, I got you back, so let's let's keep going. I was just sharing your website because I didn't know if you were you got cut off or something. I don't see you now, but that's okay. You can hear me and and you can see me, right? Oh yeah, you don't see me. Well, you're, I don't you're not. See you. I, you're I'm, not missing. I'm afraid much. if I if I go back, I might miss you again. Hang on. Okay. Okay. Well, let's let's keep going. Um, so just keep going, man. Yeah. Okay. You're 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 breaking up a little bit, but we'll keep going. I see you. Great. So you I'm, see yourself, I'm right? Back. Good, 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 good. I do see myself now, yes. Excellent. Um, so let's talk about, um, I recommend everybody check out um, the Elvin recording. So you traveled uh, obviously a long time and lived for a while in Mali in Africa. Is that correct? Right, right. And um, we were talking a little bit about um, the grooves and the uh, so much that you learned there, but I was really interested in the push and pull of um, when we talked about how children learn the, the rhythms there and absorb it in a way that you had never experienced before and how there's like, you know, it's part of woven into the culture, I guess is the way I understood it. And no, no improvisation, you have to learn the right rhythms to play. So that maybe we, I just wanted to talk about your takeaway from that um, and a little bit more of how, like we, we started talking about last night, what you, the way you saw people learning the rhythms there. 
Well, you know, a lot of West African tradition is 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 built on a different level of learning. Um, uh, when you learn in in the West over uh, in America, European culture, we learn like A B C one two three. We learn how to say our parents' names. We say our names. We learn the vowels, and we learn numbers. Right? We learn shapes. We learn colors. If you can imagine in a country in a place like Mali, even even in Senegal, then all of that West Coast. Uh, when you learn those things, there's music attached to that. Mm -hmm. So if you're a young child and you're learning the colors in the Crayola box of crayons, purple, blue, black, orange, green, whatever, there's a song for each color or a note or a rhythm or a pattern. So you're learning the colors and you're learning uh, your ABCs or your vowels, etc. but you're learning it with sound, a kora, a balafone, a djembe, something along that line. So when you're building up your vocabulary and your your knowledge as a youth on how to speak someone, sorry, I gotta, I'm trying to relax outside. I got a truck passing by. It's all good, we hear you great. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's part of the ambiance. Yes. Um, when, you're, when you're learning those things, you're learning songs too. So you're not just learning the alphabet, but you're not just learning the color or the number or multiplication or addition. If you can imagine, for example, when you learn about the color blue, that's a paradiddle. When you learn about the color orange, that's a Swiss triplet or, or a triad on the piano or a, a, a sharp nine chord. So this way you're getting the information in a different way. By the time those young folks get on an instrument at age eight or nine, they're pretty deep in the concept of music. They're not going to a store to buy an instrument. I'm not taking the pop shot at anybody's culture. That's just the way it is. And it's been that way for more than 40,000 years in those places. But the fact of the matter is they're learning at a high level and they're getting deeper information. And when you're, when you're, when you're young and your brain is still growing and information is still sticking, that's the time to put those, those things in the machine, into that hard drive. Mm -hmm. It's going to work out better for you later on down in life. So I just noticed I saw young girls playing what we would call jacks. They had small stones and they were clapping and snapping and doing these footsteps and they would throw a few stones on the ground and pick them up. And when I figured out what they were doing, one of the songs was in 12 and the other one was in 17. So, um, and it sounded like 4-4, but I, I recorded it on my cell phone. And I had to go back to my hotel to figure it out. I didn't figure it out when it was happening, but that's the level. So they're learning these little games, but they're getting this really deep kind of academic rhythmic timing and then their memories are really really sharp because the same way we have to remember our abcs and our multiplications and uh and our colors they're learning notes scales and songs at the same time simultaneously mm -hmm. so the memory banks are being stretched at an early age as well so then their, their recall is a lot higher wow. when it comes time to playing a rhythm to someone and they play it right back or having perfect pitch which most of those children have before age 10. They don't have wow. the tuners. They hear a song and they, when I did my sessions out there, guys brought their, their Camel and Ngonis and instruments to the studio. They said, we'll put the track on. And they put their ear to the speaker and then wow. they tune their instrument. And it's not out of tune. They played the a whole track perfectly in tune. Wow. You, you told me also that you, like, you were there for a while and traveled and stayed for a while before certain masters would like meet with you or like, Ex, you know, talk to you about things you wanted to know. Is that did I understand that right? Like you did, you did. I mean, yeah. I mean, the information isn't for everyone, and you can't. I was really hungry, and I wanted to know certain things. I wanted to know uh, susumba rhythms. I wanted to know the maracatu stuff that I learned in Brazil, but it's really from Angola. What uh -huh. was it when it, before I got to Brazil? You know, the different types, of ways of playing six. The hand drummers there were also frightening. I was just trying to transfer some of those patterns into my kit and learn, you know, where's the one? And yeah, yeah. Where's the, where's the three and where's the six? But right. um, yeah, I, there were people who, they would drop names on me and they would say, oh, that so-and-so's dad, uh, uh, you know, a, a day or so north drive from here is the master of that style. Right. So I would say, oh, what village is it in? And I would get a driver and I would go and, you know, they're not into this kind of colonial show up and excuse me, I'm looking for so-and-so and 
I need you to play that rhythm so I can record it and take it home. No, no, no. Uh, That's not how it works. <laughs> those rhythms and those beats are ancient and they're connected to uh, marriages, uh, um, childbirth, or a harvest time, rain, um, all kinds of fantastic things. You know, you, you know um, a new family member, someone returning from a trip, someone to get ready to go on a trip. All those things were all tied in together with those rhythms. So uh, it took, you know, like I told you last night, I was going four times a year for four years before I got even into the lobby of being able to talk to any of those gentlemen about what I was trying to learn. Wow, that's amazing. And the the rhythms, so the rhythms are attached to the different events of life or the calendar things like they're, they're played ceremonially like in the in the community where like everyone knows the rhythm and they play their part, right? Like there's, they're not improvising anything. Uh, it depends. Everything isn't like that, what I'm telling you. Some of the things I was interested in were ancient and, and uh, de dealt with, you know, lifestyles. They're hard, they were terrifying improvisation drummers that played yeah. along too. Right. But it depends on the event. Uh, as I mentioned to you, like say the wedding drummers, you know, there's a specific pattern for, for your mother to come out, Joe. Uh -huh. There's a specific pattern for your dad to come out. <laughs> because both families hire drummers. If you're getting married, your, your, your parents are gonna hire the, the, the drummers they want to play for your wedding. So first they gotta play for your dad, then they have to play for your mom. Then they have to play for you because you're the son now about to get married. Yeah. Then the other drummers do the same thing for the, for the bride. Mm -hmm. And then the drummers your dad chose have to play for, for they soon gonna be family now right so yeah. your dad plays for the for your father-in-law etc etc so there's specific things that happen there yes once those ceremonial pieces are over and you get to the festive part of the of the wedding then you hear the magnificent and insane improvisation oh wow okay amazing so last thing on on this um i don't want to keep you here all day if i could uh um <laughs> Is you you sh um you shared a link. I'll guys, I'll clean up the link I posted because I, I realized it didn't. It might have posted with some of the text mixed together. But Will shared me um some uh, a couple of songs from a singer from Mali. And Will, you have to help me out with the pronunciation. U is it Unu? Umu, Umu Sangari is her name. And the song is called Saye. Se Seya. 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 Yeah. So that so that that rhythm. I was listening to it earlier. It's like a. It feels like what I would call a six, but like the the way it's pulsed is very like not. And you you shared, and then Will also shared. It's in the in the links, um, something from his life in this world album, which I think reflects some of the things you picked up on your travels there. Correct. That's a Mali in six, and if you listen to it, the pattern is the pattern is played one two three one two three left right right left right right left right right left right right. And the left foot is playing a higher pitched bass drum and the right foot is playing the main kick. The thing is, if you listen to the pattern, you'll think the left foot is the one and it's not the one in terms of the song. The uh -huh. song's in 4-4, four, four, but I'm playing that pattern in a 6-4 pattern, which is a Malian 6, to go over the four. And if you listen to the track, once I go to play the swing time, you'll hear the, where the time actually is. But yes, it's... um. It's it's a six over the four. Wow. And I just put the pattern in that way where if I was playing with hand drummers, that would just be straight six. But I'm playing the great composition by the great Thorny Smut, a song called Evidence. Um, I'm dropping the six over the four. And it works mainly because of Monk's piano parts and the way he plays the melody. That's why it's it can work there. And then you'll hear when I go to the opening solo, piano solo, um, I go to straight swing time you'll be able to hear the difference. Wow, yeah, everybody's gotta check that out. It's just absolutely amazing. And the, that the, I, I was just fascinated with the two, you shared two links of other tracks besides your track and hearing the different ways that Molly and Six is played on those two different tracks you sent was an education by itself. And I didn't know what you were doing with your feet. I heard those two pitches, but you can't see your feet in the video. So I was like, how is he doing that? Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's left, right, right, and then my foot, my left foot is on the hi-hat and the left bass drum. Okay. And that's what confuses a lot of jazz guys because when they hit a hi-hat, immediately they assume it's on two and four. Right, 
for that pattern, the hi-hat is on one. But that's just me being creative and trying something new and putting my foot on both pedals yeah. and playing yeah. simultaneously. So you're getting the one uh, hit on the left foot and the hi-hat at the same time. Right. That just helped me to play the two better. But for some people, it was confusing. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's what happened. That's cool. Um, uh, my friend Fabino Machado actually jumped the gun right to the question I was going to ask you next, which is, um, what about a book, Will? Is there a book in the works? Have you done? Man, you know, you know, that's a thank you for that question. I have about 15 of them that I started. And, <laughs> you got to finish one, man. <laughs> I got it. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. And, 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 and the lockdown and COVID was the best time for me to, to do it. But, um, I think I'm going to, uh, at this point, Joe, I want to combine the book. I don't want it to be a rock book or a jazz book. or a, um, That's why I like Ted V. to the patient, because it's just notations. Mm -hmm. And then you can, you know what I'm saying? You can put it in whatever you want to put it in. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I love that book so much. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm going to think about some um, cliche Will Calhoun things, mm -hmm. like the cult of personality intro and some things that I, the way that I like to play time. Uh, with loose hats and things Tony Williams uh, uh, showed me and things that I watched Tony do, how to make time wider without speeding up or slowing down with sound, you know, how you play the hats and, and how you lay into the bass drum. I want to get into more of those things. And now that we have all of this um, technology, I could really get detailed with um, explaining and showing uh, uh, why, you know, making a, a dotted quarter note out of a dotted, out of making a dotted quarter note out of a dotted, out of a quarter note mm -hmm. and not having to change the rhythm. You can sonically make it sound like another half a beat by doing some really simple, very simple things. Mm -hmm. and, and it's it's a great tool to be able to expand your knowledge on rhythm and sound. As right. drummers, right. we must be masters of both. We have to be able to manipulate the sound. We're the magicians. We got to make the guitar player and the bass player happy and the singer happy and the conductor happy and mm -hmm. keep everybody in line. So it's very important that we also, technique is great, sticking is great, but know your length when you hit your cymbal and the bell and, and a, a heavy pair of hats versus a thinner pair of hats and the kind of heads you're using and mm -hmm. the strokes you're using on the drums. All of those things are as important as the academic things we learn on the drum set. You know, it's great. A lot of the digital books, the ones we're doing with Hudson now are, are like, you have the book, but everything, the, it's all downloadable content. And then you also have the digital version. So everything you're talking about, honestly, like it's the ideal time to document it because you can show like your sound is so unique. Like you, your, your technique is it's smooth and fluid, but you have, a, you have a very signature way you hit the drums to me. Like you could document that better now with the, with the concept. So I for, I, for one, hope that you, uh, Get to the finish line and and hey, you know, talk to me when you do. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I will, Joe. Definitely, man. You've always been a great supporter, and and I, I appreciate it. But I have to get that. It's important, and I think I have enough now. I want to say that's not just living my life and living color. You know, yeah. um, I can talk. I can put things in a book from Mali, from Morocco, from Senegal, from Cote d'Ivoire, from all these other places where all these hip patterns, man. You put mm -hmm. them on a kit, and they just you know they're sexy. You know, it's, they're very, they're, they're, they're killing. Just the fact that you've, you know, you're an inspiration that you travel to all those places and, you know, you have this repository of all this stuff inside of you. And when it comes out of you, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to blow smoke, but when I feel like, I feel like I'm seeing those places when I hear you play sometimes, you know, and it's, it's pretty moving. So I'm sure drummers would love to, love to hear that, you know, to see that documented so they could learn. Um, before we run out of time, I do want to, I do want to. Talk about Sabian. You've been with Sabian quite a long time. There's some signature symbols. Um, yeah. So I, th I think probably cl closing in on 30 years, maybe? 1990. Since you called me yesterday, I looked it up. I think it was 1995 or 96 when I made the switch. Okay, so 95. That would be 25 years? Yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. I, I think it's around that time. I found some recordings where um, I went to Sabian before I signed, and I pulled a few things uh, uh, thanks to Billy Zildjian, I pulled a few things out, and I and I auditioned them, and um, the whole family was great, man. Everybody, you know, Andy, Sally, and, and and Bob, they were all really great to me. There was no rush to do anything, and of course, Mark Love. There's nobody better, in my opinion. Yeah, um, that knows how to dial up and get you what you need. 
at the time. And there was a David Vi there too when I was at the time. Yeah, He's retired. David, yep. He's a fantastic cat, great musician. He, you know, played guitar, so he had the frequency thing already dialed in. So yeah, it's been great. The family's awesome, and Sabian allowed me to, you know, I kind of switched because I Living Color broke up for four or five years, and um, I wasn't playing that music all the time. I started working with Wayne Shorter and, mm -hmm. and, and commercial artists, and I was trying to get another vibe for myself. And Sabian gave me that opportunity to come up and try some things, and then I was able to do some get some other sounds, you know, that mm -hmm. I, that I, 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 I with Living Color that was my day job for many years, so. I was just dialed into that zone. And when it came time for me to do other things, Sabian was, was really great and, and awesome about uh, letting me try hats. And then and then shortly after designing my own symbols, which the, the Calhoun Mad Hats, I, will, I always used bottoms. Right. Um, like um, like two bottoms, you mean? Vivid and Time's Up. Those are new beat bottoms. <laughs> um, I used new beat bottoms in college when I was at Berkeley. I've always used bottoms. So I wanted to, to create something and then the older jazz guys talked to me about not having symbols be the exact same size. If the top symbol's a little bit uh, 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 shorter than the than the um, the bottom symbol, you're not going to get the the air sound and the chip sound will be smoother. Right. Then it, it won't be so tight. It won't choke. So I that think. That was right? an idea. Yeah. On my Mad Hats and then the ambient ride. I was just trying to design a ride symbol. That I can I call it my blue jean ride. It works in all situations. Yeah. Jazz, rock, sessions, drum and bass. I started hanging out in London around that time in the early nineties oh. with drum and bass DJs and and playing in raves and starting to see how my sound could match programmers. Because mm -hmm. the drum and bass programmers were different from hip hop programmers. I knew how to do that with the NPC, but when I went to London, those guys were using like fifteen different drum samples on one song. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you mold your sound? Getting back to what I said earlier, your sound coverage. How do you mold your sound into samples to stay out of the way of the sample? So Sabian's been fantastic, man. Uh, all yeah. my ideas, Alien Disc. And their standard stuff is great. The AAX stuff is great. Uh, 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 you know, I, I use some of Neil Peart's symbols. Mm -hmm. uh, the Evolution series, Dave Bucko. I, I use a bunch of different things depending on the vibe. But... Mostly my Calhoun ones, but I, I try to use a few different things when the music calls for it. Yeah, those, those things are great. I at one point I had the whole. I still have my Alien disc for sure. That's like a must. That's a must have for your for your special effects, man. It's cool. Are you doing any? Um, are you doing any private teaching? Like, can people study with you or? They can. I mean, they can contact me online at info at willcalhoun dot com. Mm -hmm. uh, that's info i n f o at willcalhoun dot com. We can do sessions you know uh, with the venmo with the cash app so on i am connected to meat hook but for some odd reason maybe it's my digital record uh <laughs> paypal doesn't like me and the meat hook situation is hooked up through paypal and it's not letting me do it i talked to the manager it works for a while then it cuts off and they said i didn't register so maybe somewhere along the line i pissed somebody off at paypal i don't know but um i can't seem to get that system to work so i am on meat hook but at the moment, it's not uh, functioning for me. It's not the meet hook guys. It's just the PayPal. And I'm their sure. new situation is basically connected to PayPal. So if anyone wants to do anything immediately, info at willcalhoun.com. We can Zoom it. We can Skype it. Whatever you want to do. Brushes, rhythms, uh, mm -hmm. hand technique, et cetera. Feel free. Ask the questions. We'll set it up and make it happen. Nice. Um, and if you, any of you guys um, forget, I'll post that as well as all the links in the SEN forum. So make sure you got, make sure you guys go to sabianed.com. I'll have all that information there. And the, the links are really easy to access in the forum. Um, so I guess last thing, Will, you're, you're, um, you know, we're all not, I know you have had a lot of traveling and gigs canceled as our, our industry has been utterly uh, hit the freaking brick wall with this uh, COVID thing. But um you're doing some film scoring, are you not? Yeah, I have two that I'm being considered. I've submitted some songs uh, to your audience respectfully. I like to keep it real. And I'm sorry I'm late. Um, <laughs> I had a meeting this morning, and we didn't have traffic before in New York City. <laughs> it's back. Since, it's back, man. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, 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 like three days ago, there was nobody on the road, and now it looks like a Indianapolis 500 race before it starts. Yeah. So it's it's a lot of. But anyway. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I had a meeting and I have two on hold and I have a 
a great opportunity to work with this artist. And if you want, I'll send you her name and her info, but she's a sculptor, a, a Dutch woman, and I'm doing music for her sculpture release at this huge gallery outside of Amsterdam in, in the fall. Mm -hmm. And she wants to, me to compose music to her pieces. So she sends me the, the footage on how she designs the pieces. And this music will be played in the, in the museum as folks walk up to it and, and look at the, the, her, her pieces that she has. So that's exciting. It's a different kind of a project and it's a nice challenge for me since I'm home and I have all these freaky sounds and indigenous instruments at home anyway. Yeah. Uh, it's a good time to do it. So yeah, I have two films on hold. I'm submitting tunes, talking to directors. And, and outside of that, um, uh, my next performance I'm being invited to, I play in a great trio called the Zigzag Trio, myself, mm -hmm. Vernon Reed, and Melvin Gibbs. I'll send you that link because we do have a record out. Okay. Um, if those are still, if I can still say that word, record. Yes, I like <laughs> uh, that word. I'll send, I'll send you the link to that. Uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna go. We we're supposed to play the Montreux Jazz Festival in Brazil, and due to COVID, the promoter, luckily, he's he's gonna have us going to a recording studio with multiple cameras, and we're gonna do the live show in a performance studio oh, great. and mix and edit it there, and then they're gonna upload it onto their site as a festival date. So I can send all of those things to you, Joe. Yes. But outside of that, man, you know, trying to practice and. It's a great time. You know me, I'm a, I'm a nerd when it comes to toys and gear and gadgets. So it's been a great time to dig through a bunch of gear and gadgets and try different things and sounds. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. We're all, we're all going through a process of discovery, learning new things. I know I have my, my few things, some, some drumming and some actually not drumming, like, you know, getting better at using a circular saw, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> but Just be careful, man. Be careful. No, I know. I shouldn't be doing that. I shouldn't even say that. Um, <laughs> Well, this has been great, Will. We got and we got you. We got you, like you know, at home. It's like it's kind of cool that you just you know out out on you're sitting on your front porch or something. Where, I where just are you? went out to the back, yeah, man. Uh -huh. And um, you know, um, it's it, it, it's like I, I had a, a setup I wanted to do in the background with my studio and everything. And I said, you know what, that's kind of been done before. Let me just keep it real. And once the, like the the traffic just sort of humbled me. Well, and I said, let me just get back and just sit down outside on a on a on a on a, uh, a chair and just have a chat with Joe and just keep it, keep it, you know, really tangible. And on the this table. was, this was perfect. And I got to say, Will, I, I, for one, I'm to it's even during COVID Will Calhoun is busting in from a meeting in New York traffic and squeaking in at the buzzer to join me online. That is impressive, dude. That is very impressive. But really, Will, it's, it's truly been an honor having you on, you know, I've been a big fan and, um, Thank you for being a friend of SEN and participating in our live events. I hope to get you on another one when we can do it again. Um, and thank you for spending an hour with me today and for enlightening all of us. And uh, if you enjoyed it, I'll uh, suck you back in in the future for another one someday. We'll do it, man. Maybe when the next piece of music comes out, I'll send you uh, an advanced copy. We can talk about it. But uh, Joe, congrats on everything. I think you're doing a great job. Education is a very important part of our business and it's not easy. And unfortunately in our culture, educators aren't paid what they're supposed to get paid. Mm -hmm. um, but it's nice to know that there are teachers and instructors out there that give enough of a damn that wanna you know, help people to become better thinkers and better, better learners and, and more creative uh, mm -hmm. in their way of life. So uh, to you and to everyone at Sabian as well, that's, I'm, I'm glad that that's still in the top three necessary things for us as artists to pay attention to and participate in. Well, thank you for saying that, Will. I mean, I, on behalf of all the SEN teachers, it really means a lot. And I think it goes to show a lot for Sabian that even during this hard time, they've kept the Sabian Education Network alive yeah. and kept me out here, you know, sharing the love and having great guys like you on all the time. So thank you for that. It's really, really means a lot. So thanks for joining us, everybody. And, and Will, it's been an honor and a pleasure, like it always is. Um, Don. Great having you. Dom will be back on um, Thursday with his guests, and then we'll be back with the round table on Friday, our regular 2 p.m. slot for those two things. So join us. Will, thanks again. Everybody have a great day. We'll see you next time. Thanks for the comments, Joe. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.